Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about diversity issues within the addiction and recovery field. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Marco E. Jacome, Chief Executive Officer, Healthcare Alternative Systems Incorporated, Chicago, Illinois. John De Miranda, President and CEO, Stepping Stone, San Diego, California. William Lossie Bratt, Board of Directors, Southeastern Regional Representative, Faces and Voices of Recovery, Cherokee, North Carolina. Dr. Clark, why should we be concerned about ethnic and racial uh, differences within the addiction and recovery field as well as other differences? Well, one of the things that uh, we want to make sure is that people who have substance use problems are able to recover and that the materials that we use uh, can assist them in that process. And so we know there are differences associated with uh, cultural values and beliefs uh, starting from how one physiologically responds to a particular substance of misuse to uh, how certain substances are used in cultural context. So if we're going to facilitate recovery, we need to understand uh, the language, the beliefs, the social context associated with those substances. Some, and that will help uh, us facilitate that person's recovery by showing that we understand the life experiences uh, that they have associated with their use of substances. And I gather that includes prevalence as well. Well, yes, I mean, but from a clinical point of view, I mean, people look at epidemiologic data and there are differences in prevalence, but the key issue for the individual who has the problem, whether you have a low prevalence phenomenon, for instance, Asians tend to have a lower prevalence of alcohol misuse uh, than other ethnic groups, but imagine you're that person who has the alcohol problem. Now, from a cultural point of view, it may mean that you may have a harder time getting support from your uh, uh, community, but the fact is you need to be able to put together a recovery plan and need to be able to operate with that recovery plan in mind. And I think then people who are helping to facilitate your recovery need to be aware that you may have fewer assets in your community because the problem tends to be rare, but you still have the problem. And Marco, um, that includes also socioeconomic differences, right? I'm sure that in your practice, you see a difference between sure. one sector and another. Absolutely. You know, uh, even within um, cultures, we have subcultures. And social economic status, education, um, plays a major role in terms of recovery. Um, we target mostly in our center um, uh, blue-collar workers. And the approach is totally different than middle class and upper class uh, Hispanic. William, within the Native uh, American Indian community, I, I'm sure there, there are going to be so many differences, differences mm -hmm. between the, among the tribes and even within the tribe. Can you uh, address some of those? Oh, most definitely. Um, the interesting thing is with Native American tribes is previously people would automatically assume that one tribe was the same as the next. Um, my particular tribe, the Cherokee, are completely different than our cousins out in Oklahoma, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Within our reservation in North Carolina, we have seven individual communities, and each of those communities is completely different. We're, not, we're, we're a collective people, but we're all individualized in our communities. And how do they differ in terms of service delivery, for example, when you have to address their addiction uh, issues? It comes down to developing that level of trust. Uh, some of our communities, it seems to be the communities that are closest to the center of, of the reservation are more apt to seek services as opposed to some of our more isolated communities, especially up in the mountain regions. Mm, very good. John, in, in your line of work, you deal mostly with LGBT communities, and I know you have experience mm -hmm. with uh, the uh, disability uh, sector mm -hmm. as well. Can you talk to us about particular idiosyncrasies within these that, that need to mm -hmm. uh, be addressed as opposed to the rest of the population? Yes, uh, certainly. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community 
has a variety of idiosyncrasies. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to go back to your first point, too, sure. and say that um, one reason to have culturally specific uh, treatment is because sometimes people cannot access treatment. Stepping Stone came into existence 35 years ago because gay men and lesbian women in San Diego could not get into those recovery resources that were available then. Or if they could, their experience was, was negative. So a number of people came together and said, well, let's start something for our community. And that was really the beginning of Stepping Stone. And I think that is true for a lot of these kind of culturally specific treatment programs. Um, idiosyncrasies, sure. Uh, life in an alcohol and drug treatment program for the LGBT community is very different in many ways because the issues are very different. For example, when we built the facility 10 years ago, we had this very nice staircase that was going up to the second level. And our uh, then CEO said to the architect, I want that staircase to look like a woman's high heel shoe. It does. And that's one thing that makes Stepping Stone different from other tre treatment programs. So they adapt it to their uh, aesthetic yes, uh, exactly, preferences. Yes, exactly. And the jokes are different, and the, the interactions are often very different, too. So. And I suspect that, that that makes a difference. I mean, when somebody walks in and, you know, even it's an icebreaker almost. Yes, yes. You know, for that. Yeah, the dynamics are very different. We have also transgender clients in our treatment program, which again changed the, the dynamics again, kind of like what Billy was saying, uh, William was saying, uh, that the transgender community is very different from the gay community and the lesbian community, so we have to make accommodations for that too. Mm. Marcos? Yeah, 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 it has been proven that uh, when you have uh, treatment culture specific, uh, enhance the ability to recover the individual. I'll give you an example in terms of the Hispanic population. We have a residential program where meals are prepared like home. Uh, you know, uh, it's not a cafeteria uh, meals that we prepare, but uh, we have cooks who are sensitive to the culture, and that really brings home to, to a particular person who's in recovery and engagement. So, so important for, for recovery to be culture sensitive and, and ingredients that, that enhance recovery and the support in, in, in our environment of, of treatment. And I'm glad you mentioned the whole issue of culture sensitive. I wanna go back to Dr. Clark. What does culture sensitive mean? In, if, if, if someone is, is, is uh, listening to the show, what, what does it mean to be culture sensitive? Well, we've heard from uh, our other speakers addressing the cultural differences. And the culture sensitivity means that the clinician particularly or the, the recovery dynamic recognizes that uh, a person's uh, life experiences have to be taken in consideration. So the idioms, the beliefs, the perceptions, the mores, all those things. So you may make an assumption based on your own culture that has nothing to do with this other person's life experiences. Uh, as was pointed out, food, for instance, is a, often a cultural dynamic. And you can assume that here's a dish that everyone relates to, and it actually may be so alien to the person that you're trying to help and that they don't understand what you're trying to, to accomplish. So cultural competence is what we're trying to foster, recognizing the diversity of uh, cultural experiences. Uh, and in the substance abuse arena, what we're trying to facilitate is that recovery. And in the mental health arena, we're trying to facilitate that recovery. So we need to take into consideration all those things, mores, beliefs, icons, that affect that person's perception. And the clinician or the facilitator, if you're talking about recovery, needs to recognize that. We do have an advantage, though, when we talk about cultural competence. We know we're trying to facilitate the recovery from alcohol and drugs. That's a common a motif that we can relate to. So whether it's um, an aesthetic in terms of a, a woman's shoe and a treatment program, you're still trying to um, facilitate the recovery of whether it's a gay, lesbian, bisexual individual, an American Indian, Alaska Native, someone from the Hispanic community, a white uh, from uh, Appalachia, you're mm -hmm. still trying to facilitate recovery. So that is the, the one thing that we have in terms of cultural competence. And then we have to radiate out from that by bringing in all the other um, idioms and icons and beliefs associated with uh, substance use. But we're trying to achieve that. So that gives us uh, a good position uh, to start from. Very good. When we come back, I want to get more into really the uh, specifics among groups of what the uh, 
basically the approach should be for each one of these groups within the context of providing services. We'll be right back. Well, I think treatment programs that recognize that language and uh, cultural icons and, and support uh, uh, and cultural imagery uh, play a critical role in how a person relates both psychologically and uh, socially uh, can put, position themselves to do a better job at reaching the person who's affected. Uh, and so uh, one size does not fit all, but the uh, strategy is uh, one of welcoming and incentivizing through uh, uh, environmental and social and psychological support. So whether uh, you're in a Hispanic uh, social organization or an African American social organization or a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender social organization, that's not the issue. The issue is, are you having a problem with alcohol and drugs? And if so, does your social context acknowledge that there are those problems and does it embrace recovery as a construct? Because that's the other thing we want to uh, push is social support for being in recovery. Treat me. Treat me with understanding. Treat me. Treat me with courtesy. Drug and alcohol addiction is an equal opportunity disease. Individuals in recovery come from all walks of life and deserve to be treated with respect and admiration for winning one of the hardest battles there is. Treat me without judgment. Treat me with humanity. Alcohol and drug addiction deserves proper treatment. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here. And then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had and the most important. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I am a person in long-term recovery, and in my case, that means I've been without alcohol or drugs for 35 years. During that time, I have noticed that there is a new recovery movement starting in this country, and probably about 10 years ago, and I've gotten very involved in an organization called Faces and Voices of Recovery, which is a leadership group within that movement. Uh, it's been very exciting to see that more and more people are coming out of the closet, that reducing stigma, reducing discrimination, and kind of normalizing recovery uh, is what's happening in this country. It's very exciting to see that, having a long, longer-term perspective that goes back 35 years when everybody seemed to be in the closet back then. Dr. Clark, I know that we've talked a, a little bit about certain aspects of diversity. One of them is gender, and I know that SAMHSA has a program that is targeted to women and children and pregnant postpartum. You want to talk a little bit about that? You're correct when you uh, uh, mention that gender is an important part of uh, cultural uh, dynamics and cultural com competence. One of the things that we recognized uh, a long time ago was that uh, we needed to make sure we had some gender-specific programming. And that also included uh, uh, programming that allows women to bring their children uh, into the treatment environment and uh, to allow women who are pregnant uh, to, be, to deliver in the treatment environment. It works uh, to their benefit, and it also reassures the larger community that that woman who has an alcohol or drug problem will deliver a child who is free of alcohol and drugs. So that reassures the community. It also gives that woman a, a, a greater sense of uh, personal dignity and responsibility as a parent uh, because we're dealing with powerfully reinforcing psychoactive substances and many times when uh, people have uh, the responsibility for children but who have addiction problems, they're unable to uh, maintain the necessary balance by having support 
they can achieve that balance. So we fund a number of programs that offer a continuum of, uh, of uh, support. Uh, the acute support uh, during the time the woman is pregnant to when she delivers, uh, also allowing um, in some programs up to five kids to be brought uh, into the therapeutic environment so that the mom can continue with her uh, treatment. And one of the other things that we're doing is also bringing in uh, fathers uh, into the calculus. Sometimes the uh, father or the uh, uh, other parent has a substance use problem. Sometimes they don't. But we're able to make sure that the uh, mom and her child are safe. And then the uh, co-parent who is interested in being in the life of the mother and child is able to do so, so that we give the child the best support possible at the same time helping the mom in her recovery. So uh, these become very important strategies to help facilitate because gender is important, parenting is important. And the social expectations, many of these women feel that they're less than because they have an alcohol or drug mm -hmm. problem and then sometimes they're judged harshly by the community because they're, well, why does it, if you're pregnant, you just don't stop using? Well, these are powerfully reinforcing psychoactive drugs and, mm -hmm. and psychoactive substances, so you need some uh, in a, an environment where you can facilitate stopping use of these substances. You can't just uh, automatically stop for many women. So these programs offer that. One dynamic of, of the, that program is that I thought was extremely helpful uh, was that you teach the mothers to be better better mothers. You teach them parenting skills and while they're, as you mentioned, working with the children to adapt better to a family situation, even though they may be single mothers, but it, it helps them to adapt. And Marcos, in terms of your, your program with the Latino community, I suspect that you have similar sure. approaches. Absolutely. Gender specific is so crucial because let's just talk about a woman's uh, different issues than male population. Um, in our center, um, you know, women uh, comes for an outpatient, and, and, and it's the, the issues that they bring to the table is totally different than male population. Um, so I encourage programs that even though limitations of resources might not be there to have gender specifics because women's issues with being a mother, being a, a, a wife, being a good parenting has a different connotation than a, than a male population. Um, so, um, you know, um, also the issue of, uh, of uh, again, feeling um, as a second citizen things that bring up the, um, they're never being given the respect uh, at home to be a good mother, to, to address the issues that they might have feelings instead of, uh, especially in the Hispanic population because the, um, the male uh, issue of machismo uh, bring, you know, a lot of um, issues with a woman in terms of not being felt respected and be wanted, and especially with addictions. <laughs> and I suspect that if, if programs were looking for not only what you have mentioned in terms of adapting programs to Latino communities, but also to really, we haven't really talked about checking, and I don't want to create a stereotype while talking about diversity, but really checking, having talked about the machismo, checking for other factors such as the, the domestic scene and making sure, you know, dealing with issues of co-occurring issues or domestic violence, is that appropriate? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. definitely appropriate. Yeah, in, in our center we have a co-occurring uh, mental health and substance abuse and domestic violence and, and substance abuse. Now, not everybody uh, has suffered those conditions, but you have to be cognizant in terms of be aware of that, especially in the Hispanic population. And, and William, yes. yes. Yeah, I was going to say with, with the Native American population, d unfortunately domestic violence is very, very high. So gender-specific programs are fundamental to the healing process. And um, it's just it's, it's amazing to see on my particular reservation that 99% of the domestic violence situations are alcohol-related. Wow, that's, that's, that's very, very high. high. Very, very high. Very high. high. Yeah. What other factors within the, the uh, Native community should uh, other programs be aware of? As far as cultural sensitivity? That's correct. It's been my experience on, on the reservation 
I went to the reservation in 2000. I, I was raised in the city. I'm what you would call an urban Indian. So my upbringing was completely different than reservation life. So when I returned to the reservation in 2000, I was an outsider. Even though I was a Cherokee Indian and an enrolled member, I was an outsider because nobody knew who I was. What seemed to work was when I started learning about them. Not saying, oh, I'm one of you. Learning about them, sharing their experiences, talking to them about their families. That's when they embraced me. And it's been my experience as well with counselors um, or clinicians that come from the outside. Well-intentioned, big hearts, but don't take the time to get to know their client. You know, they, they, they move right into the disorder and working on the mental health issues, but don't take the time to know the person. And in Indian country, when you take the time to know the person, you build that therapeutic relationship and that's where you get your success And then numbers. you get your trust. Exactly. Let's get into L LGBT again because I, I find it fascinating. One of the things uh, with LGBT, John, that, that I want you to address is if, in fact, they're lucky enough to get into a specific program such as Stepping Stone, it's wonderful. But if, if in fact, they, they, there are other general programs for the general population, how would one go about to, to doing some outreach? How would one make it easier for them to come into a program? Well, we do, regularly we do trainings of other a alcohol and drug treatment programs that are not LGBT specific in order to um, transfer the, the expertise that we have. And it is very specific. Uh, getting back to treatment adaptations, we learned a number of years ago that a number of our clients were relapsing because of the sex, the high-risk sex drug link when they would come out of treatment. So we designed a program during our treatment episode where we address very directly high-risk sexual behavior and the relationship with drug use. And as a result of that, the evaluations of that particular aspect of our program have been very powerful. And in fact, that's something that we're also trying to disseminate to other treatment programs because I think there is a strong link between alcohol and drug use, whether it's gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, bisexual, or the general population. There's a strong link between sexual behavior and the shame associated with it and uh, drug use. So we try and address that directly and we think other, others should uh, kind of follow our lead. And when we come back, you know, one of the things that I also want us to share is uh, co-occurring issues within special populations and also issues of other health concerns such as HIV AIDS and, and Hep C. So we'll be right back. It's important to be familiar with the proper terminology surrounding addiction and recovery. One of the terms you'll want to be familiar with is continuity of care. Continuity of care describes the continuum of care, including pretreatment, treatment, continuing care, and ongoing support to sustain long-term recovery. Continuity of care provides individuals access to a full range of stage appropriate services at any point in the recovery process. For more information on this and other recovery jargon, visit the Recovery Month website. Where's mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. For drug and alcohol treatment for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some of those um, training issues that make our jobs as trainers a little bit more difficult. Uh, and what we thought we would do is get from you, first of all, some idea about what you're concerned about. Who are or how are The purpose of this training is really to help providers develop skill and expertise in responding to the particular needs of LGBT clients so that when they come in, they feel understood, they feel valued, and they feel like this is a safe place where they can honestly receive help. This training really started with a publication from SAMHSA um, that provided a, kind of a guidebook and overview for treating LGBT people. But what we know is that a book is never enough. It tends to end up on someone's shelf never to be used. And so a small group of people started doing training in this area. We recruit participants from around the country, experienced trainers. We bring them in. They spend about two and a half days going through the training. Uh, they're led through the various uh, modules of the curriculum uh, and then during the second and third day the participants themselves actually do teachbacks on the curriculum. I was very pleased to be able to come and take this training. I participated in the original uh, book the training is based on, but this is a way of translating that information into something that people can really use that's much more live, much more interactive and I think much more effective that way and, and I needed to have some help with those skills how to do that. By participating in this training, addiction counselors will be able to continue to do all of the good work that they do in providing addiction treatment. Uh, they generally really have the foundations of that. But what they need is a way to address those same issues in a culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate way. This training is really designed to help them do that. Well, I hope to take back a sense of urgency that we should work on LGBT issues and that issues of discrimination really impact LGBT individuals. I think coming to the training, I bring a lot of passion for the subject, but it's easy for the passion to sometimes turn off other people who may not share my views on this subject. So it's helping to create more effective advocates. Well, when you're dealing with the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender population, you have to be aware of the unique culture that people come from and also the discrimination and stigma they've suffered, all of which can contribute to substance abuse as well as to relapses in, in treatment. And those pile on other stigmas and discrimination that people face. And you have to understand the whole gamut of identities that people bring. And this is a very good place. The training helps you do that and then help to translate that into a treatment approach. I also find that depending on the nature of the room, when you can walk around the room, it's a great way to make that connection with someone. Yes, I hear you get right up to them. And at the same time, I think there's some obvious positive results, such as a unified curriculum that's being offered, um, improving clinical skills for many clinicians, making the training available to other parts of the country where this type of training has never been offered. Um, but I think ultimately the long term and the real goal is that we're actually saving lives. Being able to have federal support, for both financially and ideologically to get this into a national network like the ATTC network is crucial for this to be adopted in Main Street treatment centers. My hope for this training is that every client can receive the treatment that they deserve and feel like they're respected and valued in that context. People come into addiction treatment in general with stigma and shame, feeling bad about the behaviors that they've been involved in. When you add the stigma and shame um, that are often felt by the LGBT people living in this culture, it becomes even more complicated. I want them to know that they're valuable. I want them to know that they deserve the same respect. Dr. Clark, we were talking about, John was talking about complicating factors in terms of health challenges that, that may present at the time of intake for uh, some uh, special population individuals. Can you address, continue to address that? One of the things that we at SAMHSA are stressing is that every person who has a mental health issue or substance use issue needs to also get a good physical health assessment. Mm -hmm. One of the things we know about uh, the misuse of alcohol or drugs is that it does have an effect on the organic integrity of the body. So you may get liver disease, you may get gastritis, you may get heart disease, you, you're at greater risk for various infections like hepatitis C or HIV. And and we want to make sure that 
anybody who is on the course of recovery uh, has as much information as possible. Uh, there was one quote uh, I read uh, recently, and guy says, and I spent all this time using alcohol and drugs and shooting up, et cetera, et cetera. So I finally get into treatment, only to discover that I have hepatitis C. Mm. So mm. we want to have that as an integral part because that becomes part of the cultural dynamic, and especially from a religious point of view, because you start feeling that you've been you know, visited by God in a negative way because, after all, you finally get your life on a proper course, and boom, you've got to deal with either HIV or you got to deal with uh, hep the, the hepatitis. And when you're dealing with um, uh, that, that becomes an important part. And the other factor is in that sort of I've been doomed by, uh, by God is also age. As uh, you get older, your body responds differently. And what we're finding epidemiologically is that we've got a whole cohort of baby boomers who mm -hmm. are flirting with marijuana, prescription drugs, other substances, uh, the misuse of alcohol, because they still think they're um, 25. And they have disposable incomes. <laughs> and they have the disposable <laughs> no, incomes it's, it's associated with that. And so we're finding there's been this uptick in, uh, in uh, use of marijuana and, and other substances. So we need to have treatment programs and providers and people who, who are recovery facilitators understanding that you're dealing with an older population as well as you got to deal not only with young people, adolescents and young adults, but you're now dealing with baby boomers who are um, entering a seniority and so uh, that uh, is an important part and then when you look at it from a cultural point of view particularly in cultures where age commands respect mm -hmm. the person who has the alcohol drug problem is in a conundrum because they're an elder if it's you're dealing with uh, in, in tribal context mm -hmm. they're someone who uh, uh, is uh, experienced or who um, is seen by younger people as uh, a person of great respect and yet they're struggling with their own alcohol and drug problem <laughs> so, and, and so really, that becomes an issue. When right. we're talking about at-risk behavior, we know that it exists among the pr is, and is prevalent among the general population. But when it comes to special populations, it's almost something that people really don't stop it, 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 uh, to to address as much. I, you know, because it's uh, there's a certain amount. In particular, you mentioned the the seniors. There's a certain amount of more freedom now to start dating again. And, and so I suspect that there's a lot of HIV worries because HIV, even though we think that it's, you know, has been taken care of, it's, it's I think it's showing its ugly head again. So, so you know, from um, our treatment approach, we, talk, uh, we take the uh, public health approach, which uh, only person uh, not only being looking into addiction, but what is the other conditions in my brain? Um, especially with uh, uh, the Hispanic population. Um, uh, the socioeconomic uh, part plays a major role because uh, people who've been in addiction haven't seen the doctor for, for, mm -hmm. for years. So, um, you know, primary health, health is a big issue with us. Um, when they, they're doing recovery and they found out, oh my God, I haven't seen my doctor. Now I'm scared to see what else is the condition I have. So um, it's important to address. It's important to address uh, not only, you know, from, from the addiction perspective, but also the primary health and housing, education, all areas of life. Because recovery means that you're changing behaviors in all areas of, of your personal life. And I'm glad you mentioned recovery. Um, Faces and Voices for Recovery provides um, uh, an individual an opportunity to join others and to figure out ways to support each other and to sustain recovery. And we haven't gotten to the fact that once we do get a person to go into recovery, that there's also a need for either a mutual support group or some other type of activities within the context of uh, ethnic and racial and other uh, special populations. Mm -hmm. uh, what is important to keep in mind in terms of a person that is in recovery in order for them to sustain their recovery? Well, in order to sustain recovery, as we all know, a mutual support network is, is vital. And from a tribal standpoint, it's community support. Because unfortunately, what faces and voices, what we're striving to do is continue to battle the stigma and discrimination that people with an addiction continue to face. Well, in Indian country, it's almost twofold. Um, you have still the struggling addict is 
criminalized. And when they get into recovery, if they have a mutual support network and the community embraces them and continues to nurture them on their recovering journey, they're successful. But it's, it's important. I mean, you can go to, I'll use a personal example myself. When I sat there and um, having been raised off the reservation, I had tried traditional 12-step meetings, um, counseling, inpatient, outpatient. Something just, just wasn't working because even though I would go into these 12-step meetings, I just did not feel a part for whatever reason. At that particular time, I did not feel a part. Well, when I went to the reservation and got into a culturally specific recovery plan that taught me culture and tradition, something happened. But what basically saved my life was, like most tribes, historically, when one member is down, the whole tribe comes together. Well, for my particular case, when I was down, my immediate family that was in recovery came around me and as well as the community. Mm -hmm. And that's what saved me. And, and we've kind of taken the community aspect to another level as well because so many of our clients are marginalized. They're HIV positive, they're in recovery, they're lesbian or gay. We decided to introduce into treatment the whole concept of advocacy, both self-advocacy but also mm -hmm. societal change advocacy. Uh, and it came to, a fore, uh, to the fore last year when the state was cutting HIV services. Some of our clients in treatment said, you know, we'd like to start a letter writing campaign mm -hmm. to the governor to see if we can reverse this because this is important to us. So we, we facilitated that. So we do advocacy as well as treatment at Stepping Stone. One of the greatest things I think that from the federal government perspective has uh, taken an approach not only that uh, the treatment is one of the ingredients for recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so many doors for recovery. And um, creating an ecosystem in our communities, making responsible communities that, uh, you know, recovery is important and that the person who is in recovery to feel part of the, of the ecosystem, the community. And, and that is a great thing. I think that uh, now the emphasis is not only treatment is important, but what happened after treatment. And that is the federal government, um, one of the blessings that they have done. But I think we need to disseminate to uh, a state government. It still is not happening. They're paying for treatment. But what happened after treatment? They're so not paying for the they're recovery. Not paying for they, the don't, recovery. They, don't, they don't see the outcome. And I don't, I don't think they're paying, but I think we have to uh, create these ecosystems in our community, make them part of the, the, the community is responsible for the individual to support and to access all the areas that they need in well, terms Marco, of Well, Marco, I know you're recovery. very good because I've been to Chicago to some of the Recovery Month events, mm -hmm. and they're, they're very well attended. You know, you get almost 200 people in a room to recognize those that, that have graduated and those that have been in recovery for many, many, many years. And it's growing. Actually, the last time we were, were probably three years ago now, we have about 500 people who uh, celebrate in terms of acknowledging uh, their recovery mm -hmm. uh, and the years. And we do the walk, also recovery, you know, a whole bunch of organizations we get together and things like that. But Dr. Clark, I think it has to go beyond the recovery month. I mean, recovery month is fantastic and, and we certainly support it, but really um, what do ethnic, racial, and, and, and special populations need to be cognizant of that, that maybe they're not yet? Well, I think as with any population, what we're trying to foster is this understanding that we're dealing with powerfully reinforcing psychoactive substances when we talk about the misuse of alcohol, when we talk about the use of methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, uh, prescription drugs, and that the person who is at risk is anybody in the community. So from a prevention point of view, you understand that, uh, and from a recovery-oriented point of view, that it's not just the individual who, has the, the, who is the beneficiary, but that individual's family, which is very important, especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, racial and ethnic groups. Family becomes very important, so the family benefits, and then the community as a whole, as was, uh, William was pointing out, 
the community not only uh, contributes to the recovery of the individual who has the alcohol and drug problems, but the community benefits from that. Because with regard to the substance use, that person who is now in recovery can give back. Uh, it can function as a role model for young people, young adults, adolescents who are struggling with alcohol and drugs and the pressure to use alcohol or, or, or drugs and that person is able to give back and then uh, rallies around. So the cultural dynamic is very, very important. So recovery as a cultural motif is very, I, I like the whole notion of the uh, recovery ecosystem, a recovery-oriented environment which allows everyone to participate, not just the person who has the alcohol and drug problem, but that person's family and that person's community because the beneficiaries go well beyond the individual. And when we come back, we're going to continue to chat about this. I'm going to come back to you, William. And we're also going to get into, you mentioned something very interesting that I think we need to cover. It's the whole issue of prevention. We'll be right back. For more information on National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, events in your town, and how you can get involved, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Our program is multifaceted. It incorporates both group treatment and individual treatment for Asian and Pacific Islanders who are struggling with chemical dependency. Um, we, use, uh, we use incentives to keep people motivated in treatment, and uh, we use both sort of informal and formal uh, interventions. I like the diversity of the clientele that we we get here at Team 360. Regardless of ethnicity, each of their stories are so different from the next. But for some reason, when they come into group, they support each other and they know how to... There's just this warmth and this support, um, even though they're so different. It's just a very comfortable place to be at, and I think uh, there's a lot of uh, open-minded individuals. So like uh, if I come here, they're not going to be like, uh, look at that drug addict. They're just like the opposite. They're like out here willing to help you out. The challenging and the rewards of what I do in recovery is that uh, I get to see individuals uh, really improve their lives, not only um, in their recovery, but focus on their everyday stressors. And uh, they're able to cope with it in a uh, much better improved way. Our program is based on the matrix model intervention, which uses cognitive behavioral tools. So we talk a lot about how thinking affects feeling and behavior. And we challenge negative cognitive distortions that lead to emotional symptoms that, that lead often to, to use. I look at it like this. Using drug is going wrong way on a wrong way street, one way street. The further you go, when you make the U-turn, it's going to be further to come back. So sooner you realize, it's less you have to come back. We're very strong in our advocacy for our clients to avoid the people and places that lead to dangerous situations that can lead to use. And that's one of the things we celebrate as well. If someone recognized what their trigger was and they didn't use when in the past they might have used in that situation, we publicly recognize that in our, in our group setting. With the Asian Pacific Islander, there's stigma that has to do with substance use and mental health issues. And just getting people in the door to come to group is a big step for a lot of them. And that's why uh, I feel really proud that our staff is very sensitive to this. And there's no shaming in group. And we have a very positive, supportive environment. Because, you know, we're a community that uh, it's all about saving face. So, you know, if you have a problem, you know, 
whether it's substance abuse or maybe getting mental health treatment, um, you're supposed to just deal with it by yourself. You're not supposed to go outside of your family. You're not supposed to talk about your problems. Uh, being able to uh, educate um, um, our clients on um, how confidentiality works and how uh, they will be protected through it uh, has been a very uh, important piece of this, you know, of what we do. I think that the glue of Team 360 is the feeling of trust and support that is generated within the groups. Our staff is very caring and we're committed to this issue and we don't shame our clients at any time. We support them in their positive life change and we celebrate their life changes. William, you know, we've been, so far we've been talking about very specialized programs that deal with special populations. Any examples that you can bring forward of mainstream uh, service providers that have dealt with issues related to native country uh, addiction issues? Well, mainstream providers, the one that really comes to mind is the White Bison organization and the World Bridey Movement. You know, they, they started out as an original uh, RCSP program and they've developed into basically the number one culturally sensitive program that is showing great promise in Indian country. Uh, it's beginning to take hold on my reservation. It seems to be taking even quicker hold out west because as each tribe is different, culture out west is completely different than the tribal nations that are on the East Coast. So the White Bison organization uh, seems to be the one that's working the best. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Clark, I know that in CSAT, for example, a lot of special population clients go to mainstream programs, you know, to non-specialized program. Uh, what kind of success are we seeing with that? Well, the issue of cultural competence is really the important discussion point here. We do find that uh, programs that are run by uh, American Indian Alaska Natives, for American Indian Alaska Natives, or programs that, are, uh, that target Hispanics, run by Hispanics, tend to produce better outcomes than programs that uh, are not sensitive to those issues. So we use sort of a bias force uh, paradigm. There are programs that are not run by the specific population group, but have uh, modules that are targeted to the unique needs of that uh, group. So they do uh, not as well as the uh, programs that uh, are run by the uh, specific population group, but they do better than programs that are general. So when we look at the, the outcomes of, say, a woman in a, a, a male program or a general program that doesn't have any gender-specific programming, she doesn't do as well as a program that is targeted to for women, run for women, or a program that has uh, gender-specific issues. Same thing for uh, American Indian, Latin mm -hmm. Natives, Hispanics, African Americans, and the same thing would be applicable to gay, lesbian, bisexuals, transgender. The key issue is of cultural competence. Mm -hmm. And that's the theme, that if indeed you uh, know you've got a diverse population, you want your practitioners, your facilitators to be aware of some of these unique issues. And moving prior to the person even getting a problem, on, uh, as we uh, address again the whole issue of prevention, uh, are there some idiosyncrasies, going back to that word, of uh, special populations that folks need to be aware of, you know, in terms of the viewership, in terms of what the types of programs that they get their messaging from, even the whole notion, as you were mentioning, John, of using the individuals that are in recovery to go out in the community, mm -hmm. right? I think you were mentioning yeah, we, that. We have an amends part of our program where people make amends uh, that can commonly look like uh, distributing bags of lunches to homeless populations. And that's when prevention comes in because that person receiving that lunch bag from one of our clients as part of their amends project is, is maybe talking to somebody that they knew on the street. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing that this person is in recovery and that it's possible and there's your prevention. Uh, also with our population, prevention has to take place in the bars in the baths, in the clubs, and in the raves. It has to be out there in the community. So we're constantly talking about safe sex, uh, need for treatment, need for, need for uh, precautions, 
uh, and Stepping Stone becomes almost like an island of sobriety in the LGBT community that's kind of spreading out in a lot of different ways. You know, um, it's interesting because I truly believe that prevention needs to be focused on communities by communities, blacks by blacks. And no matter who, no matter who lives in, in the black, but uh, coalitions are so crucial for us to disseminate in terms of uh, underage drinking and the prevention. Um, uh, Give us an example, Marcos, of how block by block manifests itself in the Latino community. So, so we have a coalition actually is paid by the um, CSAP, the Prevention uh, Federal Government, in which we focus the underage drinking. So we have formed a coalition and the ecosystem comes apart, schools, police, community organizations, banks, everybody's involved in that. And we bring it together. And um, interesting, we hire moms to policing, uh, if you want to say it, uh, patrol. That's a patrol policing you call So the moms The moms are, are working with us in terms of making sure that they cross the street, they go to school. And it's so active, involved, the community, that uh, they're, they're feeling that they're contributing besides they're making a little money uh, for their families. So I truly believe, you know, this notion of, of coalitions and being involved in community, commu uh, uh, black uh, clubs, uh, can't promulgate uh, or disseminate the, the importance of prevention, especially in the substance abuse. And I'd like to stress as an add-on, not only are you doing block, block, block by having uh, the representatives, members of the families in the community, but also the religious community, the faith the community. And the African-American community, African -American I suspect community, that that's that plays critical. A major, that plays a major role. So you want to reach out to the pastors, you want to reach out to the reverends, uh, but not just in the African-American community because you, your religious leaders in any other community, whether it's Buddhist or Sikh or, or Jewish or Muslim, you really want the religious leaders to understand that nobody escapes alcohol and drugs. Right. Uh, I mean, the majority of your congregation may be alcohol and drug free, but there are people in your congregation who are not. And then it's an issue, just as uh, we're talking about. So using community coalitions, outreaching the faith community, regardless of your uh, religious orientation, it makes it clear that alcohol and drugs are, are a problem and that recovery from them can uh, occur and that prevention is an important message because when we find silence, when we look at our household survey data, when people stop viewing uh, a particular drug as a, a, a potential threat to the community, that drug becomes a threat to the community. Mm -hmm. That's bizarre, but that's what happens. We stop thinking of it as a, a, a potential threat and it becomes a threat. So we need to make sure that the whole community embraces that ecosystem that Marco was talking about. That's the issue. We have a recovery-oriented environment which starts with uh, community coalitions recognizing that alcohol and drugs are a problem and then move toward the treatment community and then into the recovery environment. And I w just wanted to add something real quick. With, within Native American communities, in order for recovery, to really take hold because alcoholism and addiction is real prevalent among our people. The community has to heal from within. You can have an army of sources coming from the outside, but unless the community gets vested in it and heals itself, whatever you do will be mute. And I think increasingly um, getting to going back to National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, the fact that individuals are more increasingly coming forward and telling their stories and talking about their own recovery, I think, uh, and, and, and paying back, as you, as you were saying, they can not only be used to, to help people create a peer support, but also to create a sense within that community block uh, to help prevent other, other folks from having to, to deal with this uh, issue. Yeah, role models has to come out from the community. It's not this poor uh, superstar. Um, it has to be seen as, as a real, uh, as your neighbor, your father, your uncle. And it's so crucial because sometimes we think the role model should be the basketball star, and they're so untouchable that they don't, can't relate it. But uh, if we created these role models in terms of your family, your, your teacher, your pastor, um, that will be very successful in terms of disseminating 
and and kids look up to you know the role, good role models that we have created in our communities. And that's and that's why drug courts are very important. You know, alternatives to incarceration they're very important. In Cherokee, the the Cherokee drug court. What happens is when you have a graduate, they come back and become a mentor to the rest of the defendants. And being in a small community like my reservation, chances are they use together. So when the one that's new into the court sees their party buddy being clean and sober, working a good job, clean, it works. They like, well, how did you do it? Well, I'll tell you about it. Mm -hmm. I'll, this is how I did it. And it's sort of like that peer and networking. Dr. Yeah. Clark, yeah. you wanted to add something. Yes, I, I, and that becomes important. The uh, criminal justice system, uh, law enforcement, the judges, they, uh, we need to see them as an integral part of the community ethos and the mores of the community so that uh, we get all aspects of the community working together in harmony, that ecosystem again. Mm -hmm. uh, because if the community is not safe, then you'll find attitudes in the community are really uh, negative toward um, uh, the individuals in the community who have an alcohol and drug problem. So we want to make sure that it's not only a good public health message, but a good public safety message. And the drug courts are a good model for achieving that, mm -hmm. demonstrating that an individual who has an alcohol and drug problems who may have violated the law, uh, but who is nonviolent, uh, can uh, uh, restructure their lives in a way that benefits not only themselves, but their family and the larger community. And a good model for the entire community to support those in recovery is National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, celebrated every September. We encourage you to get engaged, get involved, uh, conduct events, and look specifically in your community for those individuals that are in recovery, that are giving back to their community, giving back to their families. And we want you to laud them and applaud them because they have done a tremendous amount of work to get where they are and to overcome addiction. I want to thank you for being here. It was a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning organizing and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it. Mm -hmm.